Hi there, my name is John Alveston. I appreciate the time and effort you're taking to attend this webinar, and we're going to be talking about just an introduction to assimilation. Now, what is assimilation in a nutshell? Well, we've been called to become fishers of men, and we want to work on being as good as fishers as possible. Now, sometimes we got a lot of fish in the lake, and they're swimming by our nets. We just want to figure out how we can catch more of the fish that are already there. So for starters, and hopefully you've already downloaded your uh, manual that comes along with this. So you can go along with this webinar and you can fill in the blanks. Now I'm not going to be showing the answers on the screen, so you're just going to actually listen really closely. But if you listen closely, you'll be able to follow along and get all the main points uh, if you follow that guide. First thing is, is missed opportunities. Now this is good news and it's bad news, um, but the truth is we get double our weekly average attendance in first time visitors every year. So let me unpack that. If you're at a church of 100, that means over the course of an entire year, you'll get 200 first time visitors. If you're at a church of 1,000, you're gonna get 2,000 first time visitors. If you're at a church of 25, Okay, you're going to get 50 first-time visitors. But that's how many first-time visitors we get. It's about 4 or 5% of a Sunday. But each and every Sunday, it adds up to double your average attendance. So the question you need to be asking, and, and really look at your numbers to sort of as a barometer, how, how are we doing, is what percentage of those first-time visitors are we actually catching? So there's fish swimming right by our boat, lots of them. And if we caught every single one of them, our churches would be doubling and tripling every year. What is the percentage of fish we're catching and how many missed opportunities are we actually dealing with? Well, the big why behind this um, is the Great Commission, should you choose to accept it. And the Great Commission is literally why we exist in the first place. Now, sometimes we lose sight of that as churches and we think we exist for a million other things, but Christ created the church to fulfill the Great Commission. That is really why we're here. And because that's the main thing, if we're not actually making new disciples, we're not doing our job. That is what we're here for. Now, sometimes we get frustrated if our church isn't growing and we look at the dark storm clouds that are happening in the world around us. And sometimes we, we ask, you know, why doesn't God do something? Maybe we're just waiting on the Lord and, and sooner or later God's going to show up. Um, but the truth of the matter is God did do something. He sent you. You are in your church right now in a position of leadership for a time such as this. Is the job hard? Of course it's hard. But if it was easier, he would have sent somebody else. He sent you in this position for this time. Well, the heart of a lot of what we're doing here is the great commandment. And the great commandment, there's sort of three things I want to pull out of it. One is the love of God. Why are we concerned about following the great commission? Why are we concerned about catching these fish? Why, why do we care about being fishers of men? One is because we love God. We love God and because of what he's done for us, we want to serve him and we want to serve him with all our heart and all our strength and all our passion. Second thing is, is because we love people. John talks a little bit about how if you say you love God, but you hate your brother, you're, you're being a hypocrite. Um, we need to love the people outside of our church. God, his heart breaks for them. Our hearts need to break for them. We need to see value in that. And thirdly, we need to love our purpose. God, in giving us this commission, what an honor. What a privilege to live our lives in such a way that it makes an eternal difference. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can do in this world. You can make a lot of money. You can be famous, blah, 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 blah. That all goes away. But we've been given an eternal mandate that what we accomplish lasts forever. Personally, I think that's really cool. That's the why behind this assimilation. We love God. We love people. We love our purpose. We love the mission we've been placed on. Okay, well, let's move to who. Who exactly are these fish we're trying to catch? How do, how do we even understand them? 
And this is a super important question because the more we understand those fish, uh, the more we're gonna catch. I've got a cousin of mine who's an outstanding fly fisherman. Now, a good day of fishing for my cousin Ken isn't seven or eight fish in a day. No, it's 70 or 80 fish in a day. Well, how does he pull that off? Well, truthfully, it's because he's a marine biologist with a specialty in interior fisheries, and he knows at any given lake, at any given week in the year, he knows exactly what species of insect is hatching right now, and he's got a fly that looks exactly like what the fish are currently eating. He knows how to bait the hook. Well, we need to understand the fish we're trying to catch. Now, emotionally, I'm gonna give you just sort of a, a little exercise. I want you to imagine what it'd be like going to a mosque. Now, personally, I've never been to a mosque. I have no idea. Um, but how would you feel if you went to a mosque? Well, I know how I would feel. Um, overwhelmed. Like, I don't know what to wear. I don't know how to act. Like, I know I wouldn't cross myself. Um, do you bow? Do you curtsy? Um, I have no idea what goes in the door. I don't know how people are going to react to me. Are they going to point me out as an outsider, an infidel? Are they going to yell at me and scream? I, like, I literally have no idea. Well, that's important because the unchurched who are coming into our doors and they come in in droves, they have no idea what to expect. They come in full of anxiety, uh, full of fear, full of fear of being found out. They feel like Italians going to the German Canadian club. They don't think they're literally allowed to go there. And if somebody spots them, they need to have an excuse. I've heard story after story of people who've come to my previous church who made it as far as the parking lot and were there white knuckling it around the steering wheel for 20 minutes in tears, afraid to come inside. Okay, we need to understand that's where they're at. Well, if it's so hard to come to church, um, why, why are they doing this? Like, what is their experience? Well, there's several things that they feel when they come in. One is they feel lost, like, and physically lost. They've never been in the building before. They don't know where the auditorium is. They don't know where the restrooms are. They don't know if you have childcare. They don't even know that's a thing. Um, and that makes them actually pretty easy to spot because when they come in, they're looking all over the place. Um, but they feel lost. Second thing, they feel that they feel out of place. They don't know anybody here. Um, again, they're not one of you. They know they're not one of you. They're trying to fit in, but they're out of place. Uh, they feel not included. There's a lot of stuff going along. There's a lot of insider language that people use. There's a lot of pre-established friendships. Now, you might think about your church like, hey, we're one big happy family. But from their perspective, it's somebody else's family. They feel like they've crashed somebody else's family reunion. They feel like outsiders. And lastly, they feel judged. Like they know that they have been living a perfect life. They know that. Um, and coming into this environment, they're afraid that people are gonna find them out. So they come in already feeling all those negative things. Well, why would they possibly put up with all of that fear and anxiety to come to your church? Well, I'll tell you why. And they're fairly predictable. They want hope. Somewhere in their life, they realize they don't have hope. They've put their trust in so many other gods, the God of money, the God of fame, uh, the God of romance, if I could only find that one true soulmate. They've put their faith in all these different gods, and they've, those gods have failed them. So they've come because they're looking for hope. They've come because they want encouragement. They're discouraged in their lives and they're looking for a place where they can feel encouraged. That's why they're coming. They want friendship. They know they can grab a book. They know they can watch things on TV. But what they want is a real connection with someone who knows them and accepts them. And then lastly, they wanna be part of something. If they weren't aware that there was something bigger than themselves in the universe, they wouldn't have come. They want to be part of something that's big, something that's ancient, something that's true. And that is why they've come to your church. 
Well, what is it that we want for them? What is at our hearts for these people who are coming in? Well, the first thing is we want them to know Jesus. Again, that's why we exist, um, is to make disciples. We want them to know the same Jesus who's transformed our lives, transformed our destiny, transformed our world. What's happened to us, we want to share with them. We also want them to be our friends. Of course we want to connect with these new people. Uh, we want to be able to help them out. We want to be able to share life with them. And, and goodness, and the cool things God has done in our lives, the cool things God is, has taught us, uh, yeah, we want to share that. We want to know them personally. And we want them to be discipled. Yes, we want them to grow in Christ. We want them to be on the same journey that we're on. Um, exploring the Word of God, experiencing His Spirit, life transformation, that's what we want for them. And as I mentioned before, this is literally why we exist. Okay, well, let's break this down to the specific what's of assimilation. How does this happen and where are opportunities to catch these fish? Well, the whole assimilation process actually starts before they get into the building. It starts on social media. Social media today is the front door of your church. This is where people are going to encounter you first. Whether it's on Facebook, whether it's gonna be on Instagram, maybe even Twitter, but this is where their first exposure to them is. Now, when you think about your intentional use of social media, what fish are you trying to catch? Now, a lot of us will talk a lot of game that, hey, we're not fishing for other people's Christians. You know, we're not into transfer growth. You know, we want to actually reach the lost. But if you look at how we've bait the hook in our social media, it looks like we're fishing for people who are already Christians. The only fish we're looking for are the fish in other people's boats. Something we might not have to take a look at. What we need to ask is how are we baiting the hook when we post on social media? What do we have to offer? Now, what we actually have to offer is heaven. What we actually have to offer is redemption, new life, uh, life-changing relationship with Christ in the spirit. That's what we have to offer. But do they know that? How are we baiting the hook on our social media? And lastly, what is our call to action? And we, we preach for transformation, not information. Are we just giving bits of information or are we giving them an opportunity to respond and act on what we're showing on social media? The next step from social media is going to be our website. And hopefully social media will direct them to our website. But same question. Uh, are you fishing out of somebody else's boat? We look at most of the websites and front and center, well, here's our doctrine. The unchurch don't care about doctrine. The only people who care about doctrine are people going to other churches. Is that the fish we're really looking for? Fish who are already caught. Who should this be written for? What are the fish that we're trying to catch and are we speaking their language? When they come to our website, what is it that they want to know when they come to our website? And quite frankly, these are very predictable. What do they want to know? They want to know your location. Where is your church? If they've come to the website, they already know they're coming to the website, um, but they want to know where you are. A lot of churches do not have their locations on the front page. You have to bury in deep to find out where this church actually meets. Second thing we're looking for is the time. When does it start? Now, hopefully you've got that information on your front page, and a lot of churches don't. And then the third thing is what to expect. Particularly if they're unchurched, they have no idea. All they've seen is stuff in movies, you know, which is usually some sort of a Catholic Anglican-y kind of thing. They want to know what to expect. Do you tell them what to expect? Are there pictures of what to expect? Is there like a sampler video of what to expect? I know personally one of my most effective evangelism tools in inviting people to church is quite frankly, I've got a video of our worship on my phone. And when it comes out that I'm a pastor, I say, yeah, yeah, I know what's coming to mind. You're thinking of this. Then I pull up my phone and show them, say, no, this is what I do. And they're usually blown away that I did not know church could be like that. Okay, 
Are we showing them what to expect? The next step is our signage. They, they will actually drive by our building. Now, when it comes to our exterior signage, um, there's several questions we need to ask. One is, can you read it while you're driving? When I was a church planter, we came up with the coolest sandwich board signs designed on the computer. They were hip, they were cool, had all the necessary information, fantastic. But when you were driving by on that street, which the speed limit was 70, um, could you read anything on that sign? No, you couldn't. So can people read your sign while they're driving the posted speed limit? Or is your sign too small? Does your sign have the required information? Service times, um, phone number, website. Does it have that basic information on your sign? And then lastly, does your church have an attractive name? Now, if you look at this church here, Grace Baptist Church Independent Fundamental KGEV, you know what? That tells you a lot about that church. Does your sign, does your name tell the story you want them to hear? Or does your name just tell them where your church is? And quite frankly, if it's on the sign, they know where it is. Uh, but the sign, that's the next step. After that is the parking lot. Is your parking lot well maintained? Is it gravel? Are there potholes? Is your parking lot an embarrassment? Does your parking lot communicate that we really don't care what we do, that we don't take this that seriously? Um, or does your parking lot communicate we do everything for the glory of God? Is your parking lot, does it have newcomer parking? Now, when they come in, now, we as pastors, we love full parking lots. But think about it when you go to the store. Are you thrilled when you see full parking spots and when you have to drive around and sort of hunt for a parking spot? No, you don't. Well, have we made newcomer parking that they can find? Are we doing what we can to make this experience a positive one? Next is the front door. Do we have friendly people at the front door? Now, notice that I said friendly people. Um, sometimes we've got people at the front door, you know, we've got these grumpy greeters. Okay, we need to fire those grumpy greeters. We need to find some kind of place where they can serve, where they don't actually have to be around human beings. Uh, do we have friendly greeters who are gonna actually connect? Um, have we trained those greeters? Are we just hoping they'll be able to do this naturally? You know, there's a lot of fear uh, from a volunteer when they're not trained. They hate it when they're not trained. They don't know what to do. They don't know what's expected of them. And, and this is just sort of a freebie here. So many of them are afraid of greeting somebody thinking that they're new when they've actually been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Now there's a training solution to that. Um, and it's simply, when you see somebody you don't know, you can ask them, have I seen you here before? Or you can ask them, how long have you been coming? And then no matter how they answer that question, your answer is, I thought so. Have I seen you here before? Yes, I've been here for 40 years. I thought so. How long have you been coming? This is my first time. I thought so. Once they know how to do that, they don't have to fear that question or ever being wrong. They just have the question to deal with that. And technically, you're not even lying because when you saw that person, you didn't know. You're thinking to yourself, maybe this is their first time or maybe they've been here for 40 years. So you had a range in mind. So you legitimately were thinking you thought so. But yeah, have we trained our greeters? Um, do your greeters represent who you're fishing for? Now, this is something that a lot of churches don't consider. If we're fishing for young families, and again, I don't know what God has laid on your heart for your church and your community, but Hypothetically, say God has really put on your heart young families. Well, if that's what you're fishing for, then quite frankly, your front door greeters should have a strong representation of young families. Not exclusively so, because we want to have some breadth there, um, but do your greeters represent that? Okay, after they get past the door, they get into the lobby. Once they get into the lobby, is there anyone there deliberately and intentionally to connect with newcomers? Is that anybody's job? Because once they come in, they feel lost. Like I explained before, they feel like a, they just crashed somebody else's family reunion. Do we have anybody there whose job is to connect with them? Secondly, is there clear signage? Now, I was at a church, an awesome church, by the way, but it had vertical signage, which when the building was empty, 
it was very clear where to go. But as soon as you pack people into the room, you can't see the signs anymore. Do you have clear signage to the auditorium? Do you have clear signage to the restrooms? Do you have clear signage on where you take your kids? And if you have a coffee shop, do you have clear signage to your coffee shop? That's the lobby experience. The next stage of assimilation is the auditorium. When you, they walk into the auditorium, does anyone there actually help them find a seat? Now that may not apply in your church. If your church is small enough and have few enough people, you can see where the seating is. But once you get a little bit more full, it actually becomes very socially awkward for them to find a seat, particularly if things have already started, people standing up and singing. We as pastors on stage, yeah, we can see where the gaps in seating are, but if they're coming in, and we've seen this, people like sticking to the aisles, they can't see where any gaps are. Do we have anybody to help them actually seat themselves? Do we have ushers who actually usher? Um, if they come early, does anyone connect with them once they're seated? I'll tell you a super quick story. I went and visited a church a few years ago and came in and in the lobby, there was like the friendly lady and she connected, asked where we were from. And, you know, I was thinking like, this is a really cool church. I'm on vacation, don't live here, but you know, this, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Then I proceed into the, the sanctuary and I, I have a seat and I've got my little bulletin and I'm there. 10 minutes early, because I mean, I didn't know exactly travel times and distances, so I gave myself a margin of error. Um, but I'm sitting there, sitting there with my, my bulletin, and no one at all makes eye contact with me, no one talks to me for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 minutes. No one talks to me. And like air going out of a balloon, all the friendliness vibe just right out of there. And then church didn't start on time. 11 minutes, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 minutes sitting there with no one at all talking to me. And I made a decision in my heart of hearts, if we ever moved here, I would never go to this church. And then it dawned on me, is my church any different? Do I have people who are actually assigned to work the room. Now I do now, we've got a team of undercover cover greeters who are in the auditorium. They each have a section and they're trained, treat this section like your living room. Um, you're not working a shift, you're hosting a party. And if somebody came into your living room who you didn't know, of course you would greet them. And not only would you greet them, you would introduce them to those around them. So what are we doing to make sure that their auditorium experience is a positive one? Well, then comes the welcome. Now, there's some really important things that we often miss during the welcome. The first is, do you greet newcomers? Like I said earlier, they feel like Italians at the German Canadian Club. They don't know they're allowed to be there. Literally, my son, who's a teenager, the most common question he hears from his friends once he describes how cool his church is, is, would I be allowed to visit? Blows my mind, but the unchurched don't know they're allowed to be there. During the welcome, if we acknowledge, hey, if this is your first time here, if in fact you've never even been to church before, that's awesome. We're so glad you came to check us out. That relieves so much anxiety for them. Do we do that during our welcome? Second thing in our welcome is, do you introduce yourself? Sure, the regulars know who you are, but the newcomers don't. You're just some guy. They don't know you're the pastor or anybody else on the team. Simple little thing of introducing yourself makes it so much easier for them. Um, and thirdly, do you know, let them know what they're in for. If you go to a strange event, you want to know, is this going to be an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours? Um, what's going to happen? Is there some kind of a program? So if you just let them know, hey, we're going to be keeping you here for about an hour and 10 minutes. We're going to sing a few songs and we're going to hear a great message, you know, from Pastor Dave. Hey, that's all they need to hear. Um, but are we taking that time and consideration during the welcome stage of the service? Next is the music. Now, some questions here. Is the music from this century? Now, this has everything to do with being fishers of men. 
Uh, are we fishing from fish from the 1800s? Um, because I've got news for you, they're dead. Uh, are we fishing for the fish that are actually swimming around our boat? How are we baiting the hook? Um, is the music something current that they can relate to? Can they understand the lyrics? Now, sometimes our songs are absolutely littered with Christianese, um, and sometimes words that aren't even in English, Hebrew and Greek. Um, and there's a lot of really cool songs out there that, quite frankly, I as a Christian enjoy, but I know, wow, my newcomers aren't going to have a clue what this is about. Uh, have we given them some easy on-ramps to understand what we're singing? And then lastly, is the music too long? Now, you might, music just might be your thing, and you could sing for hours and hours and hours. But if you're a first-time visitor and you're new to church, how many songs you don't know are you prepared to sing before it starts getting really awkward and really long? Maybe three or four. So is your music too long? Well, then the message. And there's some basic mistakes we can make during our sermons. One is, do you attack the newcomer? Now that actually happens time and time again, is we start railing about the world and the people are so lost and they're so sinful and blah, 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 and we start attacking non-Christians. Well, if one of your people in your church brought a neighbor there and you start attacking that neighbor, they're just gonna slink right down into that seat. And they're going to have that experience that, quite frankly, most of us have had in our lives where we've invited somebody to church and we spend the whole time apologizing uh, for doing that. Are we attacking the people that Jesus died for, that Jesus loves? Also in our message, do you speak in plain English or in Christianese? Now, there's a lot of times where we could have used another way of explaining something. So, for example, I'm going to pick on the word anointed. You can come and say, wow, wasn't that just anointed worship? The unchurched have no idea what that means. And even if they got out their phones and went on Google for a definition, the Google definition they're going to find for anointed is to ceremonially pour oil upon. Well, when we say something's anointed, what do we mean by that? We just mean that God's using something in a special way. We could just say that. You know, there's a way to express all of our theological intricacies in plain English, if we take the time and the effort. Are we doing that with our messages? Well, how about the close at the end of the service? Do we have next steps in mind? Do we give people clear next steps? They don't know they're supposed to come back next Sunday. They don't know that volunteering is an option. They don't know what a small group is or a Bible study or whatever you call them. Um, have we made it clear that, hey, if this was something good, this is what your next step is? Um, how can they hear the gospel? Now, in theory, we, we should all understand for our churches to grow, unchurched people need to come to our church, they need to meet Jesus, and then they need to stay. Well, have we really thought this through? Was there any time for them to even hear about Jesus? Now, you can preach on tithing, and then have a little bit of gospel at the end. That's totally okay. In fact, some of the most evangelistic sermons I've ever seen where the most people have gotten saved is on the back of a tithing message. Um, but was there an opportunity for them to hear the gospel? And just as importantly, when can they respond? Did we preach for information or for transformation? Did we tell them the gospel? Or do we tell them the gospel and give them an invitation to say that prayer? What have we done when it comes to the close? All right, service is over. We're back in the lobby. And this is a mistake where most churches drop the ball. Let's assume everything has gone well up until this point. This is where they want to connect. They had God touched their heart in the message. Uh, God touched their heart in the music. People were friendly and loving when they came in. And if you're like, these aren't like fake Walmart greeters. These people really love me. There's something different about this place. And when they heard you preach, they said, okay, you know what? God is here among these people. After the lobby, this is where they're ready to connect. 
Unfortunately, most churches, this is where we abandon the field. So the question is, is there an obvious way in the lobby after the service for them to connect, for them to have more? Sometimes I think of it like a used car lot. We put the ad in the paper. People came onto our lot. They looked around. They took the car on a test drive. They met the salesman. But right when it's time to buy the car, the salesman walks away. Do we have our host teams back on duty? Like this is the time where we actually catch the fish. It's in the lobby after the service. Next is the follow-up. Did you connect, collect their info? Was there a connection card or offering envelope or when they check their kids in? Did we do anything to try to get their information? That's really important. And then when are you going to invite them back? Now, a little bit of news when it comes to following up with, with visitors is it's very time sensitive. After about 24 to 48 hours, their response to your follow-up efforts drop off dramatically. And by the end of the week, your follow-up responses will do virtually nothing. Um, are we following up fast? And have we thought through how we want to follow up? Well, what's next? Now, here's something that if there's going to be the biggest takeaway of this whole experience is that it's not good enough to be friendly. We have to be friends. It's real connection is where this all happens. And that has to be our end game of the assimilation process. And that's the beginning of the door to discipleship. Now, I'm going to say something that seems to be like crazy obvious, but Jesus actually knew the disciples. That's how discipleship works. Uh, it's something that's up close and personal. Have we thought through and have we actually made friends with these people? Because smiling and shaking hands, that's nice, but it's not going to get the job done. We actually have to build those real relationships. Jesus actually knew the disciples. And when we look at people's behavior, they may come for a show and an inspiring talk, for a little while, but they won't stay until we build relationships with them. They won't grow until we build relationships. And we need to be intentional about how this is going to happen. Well, I hope you've got something out of this webinar. I hope you've got some inspiration from this. I hope some ideas are, are percolating in your head. And I hope you find this encouraging because we do have this amazing opportunity. God continues to send people to our church every single Sunday. And when we as fishermen, as fishers of men become skillful fishers of men, and we're just gonna see more and more life change. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs>